sky with clear periods down to 2 degrees Celsius, 36 in Fahrenheit. BBC Radio Kent News, it's 5 past 1, and there's more on our website. bbc.co.uk forward slash Kent. Sport. Days out. Weather. Travel. News. The ultimate guide to where you live. In Gravesend, Tunbridge Wells, Rochester and Sittingbourne. Across your county every day. BBC Radio Kent on 96.7 and 104.2. Now forget DVDs, forget CDs, forget cassettes and even forget 45s and LPs. For years, the only way to listen to music was on a 78 RPM disc made of shellac. In the early years of recorded music, Kent was at the forefront of record production, thanks to two factories owned by the Crystal Lake Company, one at Golden Green near to Hadlow and the other in Tunbridge. So now, wind up the gramophone and sit back as Andy Garland and Andy Briggs present The Crystal Lake Story. Hello, everybody. I hope you're going to enjoy my first Rex record. It's all right. It's only a bob. <laughs> the legendary Gracie Fields on her first ever recording for Rex Records in 1935. The label was part of the Crystal Lake Company's portfolio of record labels, a company that had begun in 1901 and was to last only two more years in the music business before selling out to Decca in 1937. This is Andy Garland. And this is Andy Briggs. Our story then covers 36 years and with factories based in Golden Green and Tunbridge, early British record production owes much to the county of Kent. We'll hear from those who worked in the factories. I had never worked at Golden Green. I was always at the Tunbridge factory, which, uh, which had quite several expansions. From those who recorded the music. And I was with Crystal 8 right up until 1937 when it, when it was bought by the Decker Company. There wasn't any place to tell him how to sing or what to do, no. You can't change the style of an artist, would it? I mean, the public wouldn't like it, would they? <laughs> and, of course, play the music that was pressed from wax onto shellac, an industrial process in the Garden of England. Hello, everybody. This is Jack Payne speaking. I've signed an exclusive world contract to record my band only on Imperial. It all began in 1901 with George Henry Burt and his partner Augustus Jacob Keel, who were already in business in Golden Green making billiard balls. Burt had already developed a process in the United States for making gramophone records, the flat discs which had been invented by Emil Berliner as a more mass producible alternative to phonograph cylinders. The trademark Crystallate was applied for in July of 1901 and a few weeks later the Crystallate Manufacturing Company Limited was incorporated. The early years of the company as a manufacturer of records are slightly hazy. In a detailed article in the Hillandale News, now called For the Record, which is the magazine of the City of London Phonograph and Gramophone Society, Frank Andrews outlines several of the early labels. However, these weren't owned by Crystallate. Instead, it seems they pressed records for other concerns, or maybe just produced the shellac material for pressing elsewhere. The first pressing contract we definitely know to have been undertaken in Kent was for the Phonotypia label. Phonotypia were based in Milan and had started by selling German-produced records in the UK, competing with the likes of Zonophone Records and the Gramophone and Typewriter Company, which later became HMV. This rare 10 and 3 quarter inch example is from Jan Kubelik, a violinist of the Bohemian School, and dates from between 1908 and 1911. 1910 was a significant year for the company for two main reasons. Firstly, the Sound Recording Company was formed in Piccadilly in London, which over the years gave Crystallate more and more pressing business. Secondly, Crystallate itself went into voluntary liquidation, then relaunching with a larger capital of £25,000. The success that followed led to that value being doubled by the outbreak of the First World War. An early example of the Sound Recording Company's product was the Gramavox label, which was later pressed by Crystallate.
This is an early Gramovox record of the band of the British Imperial Guards playing a selection by the composer Guno. The sound recording company soon registered a series of further labels and made their recordings available to other clients for pressing under their own trade names. This was to set the scene for Crystal 8's later business with familiar names such as Marks and Spencer and Woolworths. In 1913, the Fernatipia contract wasn't renewed because they were building their own factory in Hartford. Although still in cooperation with the sound recording company, Crystal 8 were also casting about for other business. One resulting customer was the Invicta Record Company Limited, whose labels were Citizen and Guardsman. Charles Penrose later became famous for his version of The Laughing Policeman, but here he is from 1914 on the Guardsman label and another of his many laughing records, How We Laugh. And this is how they laugh. <laughs> and sometimes they will laugh. <laughs> In merry, merry glee, they laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Charles Penrose and How We Laugh. A name that was later to loom large in Crystal 8's history was Imperial, and in 1913, Crystal 8 bought the trade name. Meanwhile, during the Great War, Crystal 8 pressed records for the Bulldog label, owned by William Ditcham, who later joined the Kent Company. And the Crystal 8 trade name itself was re-registered in 1915. After the war, several other companies launched labels via Crystal 8, such as Bosworth & Co and Morgan & Scott. At the same time, old stocks of pre-war labels such as Gramovox and Popular started to be overstuck. That is, new customers' labels were printed and stuck over the original ones. This is a popular pressing from 1920, Mr T Hartley, and I'm forever blowing bubbles. I'm dreaming green, I'm dreaming green. And as the daylight is falling, they fall again in the morning. I'm forever blowing bubbles, crazy bubbles in the air. They fly so high, nearly reach the sky, then like my dreams they fade. After something of a false start in 1920, Imperial Records were relaunched in September of 1922, by which time it seems that Crystal 8 had taken over the sound recording company. Darrell Warnford Davis has been involved with Crystal 8 and its associated company Endolithic since 1913 and is noted as a director of all three concerns around 1922. Again, history is a little cloudy, but it would appear that Crystal 8 gained the sound recording company's label trademarks and valuable recording expertise from the takeover. This meant that for the first time, the company actually owned its own labels and was now ideally placed with recording and production facilities to capitalise on the growing market for gramophone records, proudly announcing itself as the oldest makers of disc records in England in their year's advertising campaigns. Early Imperials included both re-releases from the old labels such as Popular and Bulldog and new recordings such as this one, again from 1922, The Continental Five and a hot foxtrot just billed as Ma, but you might well recognise the full title. Chalklin, who lives just outside Sevenoaks, joined Crystal 8 at the end of the 1920s, but his father already worked at the company. He was manager of the record side, uh, and at one time had been 
secretary, but uh, as the company grew, they, he uh, gave that up, and he he, uh, he retired in about uh, when, he, when he was 62. Uh, Crystal Eight was moving into new territory with its own imperial label, which sold at two shillings, but continued with its contract work, both old and new. This included work for Curry's, the same electrical firm we know today, and many records on other labels were 5 and 3 eighths inch in diameter, as opposed to the more usual 10 or 12 inch. Some were children's records, intended for miniature toy gramophones, but most were just cheaper records aimed at those who couldn't afford the regular ones, which after all were expensive luxury items. Here's a 5 and 3 eighths of an inch mimosa from the early 1920s. We know from recording ledgers that this was recorded by Harry Fay, a prolific music hall artist on many record labels. In the ledger, though, he appears under the pseudonym of George Berry, although on the label he's not identified at all. Quite usual on these small, cheap 78s. Meanwhile, the Imperial label started to do very well, competing with the more expensive makes such as HMV and Columbia. As business expanded in the mid-twenties, several new depots for record stock were set up throughout England, including the former Bulldog Records premises in London. Its owner, William Ditcham, was now the recording expert for Crystal 8. The Tunbridge Free Press of 1925 details the annual staff excursion for the employees. After a delightful day at the seaside, the seven cars supplied by the Tunbridge Wells Auto Car Services Limited left Brighton for the return journey at 7pm. Breaking the journey at Uckfield for an hour, music and dancing were enjoyed in the commodious market room at the Bell Inn. Everyone eventually arriving home safely after a happy day. Up until 1925, records had been recorded acoustically. In other words, sound travelled through a simple horn onto a diaphragm causing vibrations which made a cutting needle move as it cut the groove into a wax disc. Electrical recording replaced the horn and diaphragm with a microphone and amplifier to vibrate the cutting head and resulted in vastly superior sound quality. The Kent Company were just behind their rivals and began experimenting in 1926. Here's a Guardsman record from 1927 the carnival dance band and only a rose. Only a rose I give you. Only a song dying away. Only a smile to keep in memory. Until we meet another day. Only a rose to whisper. Lasting as long. Here's Don Chalklin again. I joined for uh, uh, around about 1928 to start with, and then I left to go into the stock to go to go into stockbroking. Or, but I hated that, and I came back to the records uh, after about a year, uh, which, which, which I loved. It was a very, very, a very interesting uh, thing. He recalls what processes went on to produce just one record. The artists would be in London, they would record at the West Hampstead Studios, and, and then the, 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 they, was, they recorded on a wax. Uh, the wax came down to us, and we had what we call our matrix department, where they used to transfer it from wax into um, samples, stamping plates. And uh, the, the stamping plate one each side of the record went into the into the press, the hydraulic press, uh, and uh, the, beside the the press they had a plate on which they had the material. They first of all put the one label, then the plastic, then the other label. And occasionally there was thing, uh, one, one occasion went wrong because we supplied records to get up for the gift schemes, and on one occasion the labels got mixed up. And a lady, an irate lady who received the record, came along to say that, that why did she? She she asked for land and had been or something like that. And instead of which she got, I do like a pie with a plum in. Oddly, there was a certain amount of seasonal fluctuation in the factory's output. During the summer, uh, the staff had greatly reduced 
but the winter time and Christmas was the main area for sales, and that was when um, the people from the, sort of doing menial jobs around could go because it was not a highly skilled but could be dangerous operation if they got their hands caught in caught in the machine. Photographs from around this time show a pressing room containing back-to-back -back heavy hydraulic presses which run the length of the room. Beside these stand a long wooden bench where shellac compound awaited pressing and freshly pressed records awaited removal to the trimming shop. It was a pretty labour-intensive process, as Don remembers. Yes, I should think you were 60 or 70 press one. And uh, they earned very good money, and of course everybody wanted to get in, into it. As compared with local agricultural wages, the, the, the wages were, were, very, were very high, uh, or comparative. Uh, uh. I would say the atmosphere in general was very, was pretty good. Yes, because uh, we had women there too, who did the, first of all, when the records were finished, uh, uh, they were passed to another department where they, 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 they had rough edges, they had to be... Uh, scraped off, and that was we had. Another, that was another woman's job, and that, that was a nasty job because these were this jagged edge of a vinyl record. We had them, and then I had another crowd of women doing the sorting. We also, after the, the records were finished, they they just checked them on more. I think we had about uh, two, between two and three hundred. Then the record was was finished after it had been aged and sorted, and was then uh, dispatched to the record store. They had, they had the hydraulic press, say, there, and beside them they had a table, a, high, a heated table, on which they had this vinyl, the vinyl material. So they put the label on, then the vinyl, then another label, and then they closed the press down. And uh, that, that was when they had to be careful. If they made a mistake on timing, uh, uh, the pressure about a tonne to a square inch when, when the thing was closed. Was it a very dangerous process? Uh, I, well, I wouldn't have regarded it as such. There were only about two accidents in the, in the years I was there. Music production continued apace. From 1928, here's Jay Whidden and his band, and I Want to Be Alone with Mary Brown on Imperial. Oh, I want to be alone. Oh, I want to be alone. Yes, I want to be alone with Mary Brown. When I meet her in the dark, will I walk her through the park? Yes, I'll tell her she's the nicest girl in town. Is she a raving beauty? No, I wouldn't call her that. Has she a form like Venus? No, she's just a trifle fat. But she's got a lot of dough, and she's single now, you know. Why I want to be alone with Mary Brown. 1928 also saw the third incarnation of the firm, now the Crystallate Gramophone Record Manufacturing Company Limited, capitalised at £150,000. The same year also saw two new series on the Imperial label of Scottish and Jewish records, as well as the launch of a new label for Woolworths, namely Victory. The earliest Victory releases featured the Music Masters, directed again by Jay Whidden. Here's the very first, Ramona. The second, Bluebird Sing Me a Song. I'm unhappy, so unhappy, everything is wrong. Bluebird, sing me a song. And the third, in the woodshed, she said she would. The apple, she sits and in the garden, and in the garden. He even tried to kiss her on the old back porch, but on the back porch, she wouldn't go. He wondered if she was human, or if she was made of wood. At last he tried to kiss her in the woodshed, and in the woodshed, she said she would. Woolworths were an important client of Crystallate. At Woolworths, I used to deal with a buyer called Mr. Niblett, who was a, a marvellous man, a, a terrifically efficient, and uh, he had a very highly paid... Uh, their buyers were very highly paid there, and he jolly well deserved it. Uh, well, they had the, um, the, the Eclipse, 
the crown and, and victory. They're the only three I remember. They, I think that's probably the one. They, they all went out on the wall with six, under sixpence. They had to be cast off for sixpence. Well, I have said, we, we sold 10 million a year. <laughs> so they must have been pretty popular. <laughs> it's, it's rather amusing now that Woolworths have got records again. I personally thought well, that we'd never see a record again in Woolworths, but, but they're very popular now, too. You're listening to The Crystal Eight Story on BBC Radio Kent tracing the history of the Kentish pioneers of the record industry. The following year of 1929 was again significant in the company's history. It saw the arrival of Arthur Haddy, a recording genius who revolutionised their studio. I originally started life with CFL Limited, who built the first two links to the Imperial Wireless chain. Le Leafield was the big transmitter working on pulse and arcs. And uh, when Marconi brought the valve transmitters out, CFL oil went up the spout and I got taken by uh, the managing director into the Western Electric Company. Anybody and it was while I was there uh, I met my my present wife and her father uh, was a recording artist. He, he made the original record of, uh, of uh, Tipperary in World War One. <laughs> and at one time he and Peter Dawson were the only two artists so during that 1914-18 war kept under contract. Well, I went out to see this recording session. Of course, electrical recording had just started, and it was a load of junk. It wasn't Decca, it was the Crystal Lake Company, and they were making little records for Woolworths. So I went to see this session, and I jokingly said, well, you know, I think I could make a better lot than that on the kitchen table. And it only was a joke, I assure you. But about six, well, nearly six months afterwards, I had a phone call through my f would be father in law to say that the managing director wanted to see me of Crystal Lake. So I went up and uh, I'd forgotten all about this remark. And he said, Well, did you mean it? And I said, Well, it was said, it was said as a joke, but uh, I'm quite prepared to have a go. So, to cut a long story short, I, I knocked up some amplifiers and I made a cutting, <laughs> cutting head out of a blue spot loudspeaker unit. <laughs> And we took it up to the studios in Hampstead, which were the same ones, so they were crystallate in those days. And uh, we had an old acoustic recorder there who fiddled a, a cutting point onto it, and we cut discs, and sure enough, it was a damn sight better than the stuff we bought from America. <laughs> well, then they pressed me and pressed me and pressed me to leave the Western Electric Company. And I didn't want to, really, and, uh, but they offered me twice the salary. And so my wife said, you know, no engagement, no, no bigger salary, no engagement. <laughs> and that's how I went into the gramophone business. <laughs> Arthur had it, yeah, and uh, I think you mentioned in, in the end he had an assistant, and I think it was Wilkinson, who I didn't know very well, but I knew Arthur had it quite, quite well. In fact, I've seen him in, re in recent years. I, I don't think he's alive now, but um, he was a very clever and very bright chap. Was he based in the studio in London? He, uh, he, he was based at West Ham's the recording studio, yeah. yeah. And, and did he come to the factory at all? He did come, but not very often. It was a purely uh, just came to see us. I think, but really, I don't think he had no vital part. Arthur Haddy remembers the purchase of the West Hampstead Studios that year, and also some of the artists that he recorded. Sandy Powell, various bands. Uh, one of the first band I ever recorded was Jay Widden, not Jay Wilbur, Jay Widden. He was a Canadian. At the hotel where the band were playing was eventually burnt down. He was one of the big big bands of his time. Th that chap who used to make these laughing records made all those of the laughing police with a whole series of them. <laughs> oh, Leslie Cerrone, all in that Hampstead. Ah. We, we, that time we rented the West Hampstead Town Hall and it was used on, on Saturdays for Jewish weddings. And so all our gear had to be packed up and this, this was a, became impossible in the end. And it went on the market, and we bought it for £1,250, freehold. And my name was, was on the paperwork. The 1930s were Crystal Eight's heyday. Between 1930 and 1937, the major labels were Imperial and Rex. However, they continued to make 78s for Woolworths, with the Victory label giving way to the 8-inch Eclipse and later the 9-inch Crown. 
Towards the end of the company's existence, they bought out the Vocalion Gramophone Company with a clutch of labels including Broadcast and Vocalion itself. Into the 30s we go then with the famous banjo player Eddie Peabody and Tiptoe Through the Tulips from 1930 on Imperial. As well as recording artists in the UK, Crystal Lade had also manufactured records from American recordings since the mid-twenties, and this continued in the 1930s. Don Chalklin again. They had uh, uh, an arrangement whereby we used to get the masters and, and then proceed in the same way as the British um, processing. And um, there were several quite big artists. Uh, Morton Dunn, it was one of the famous ones we had. I mean, the record was just exactly the same as... Uh, it was no different. Once, once we'd got the master, it was the same as the British master. You, you, you just processed it through the metric side and... Um, uh, the, uh, from that stage on, the record was just done exactly the same. Here's an example from 1932, Cab Calloway and his orchestra and You Dog. Another important figure in the company was Jay Wilbur. He'd been musical director since 1929, and Don remembers him as recording manager. Well, Jay Wilbur was the recording manager, and he also was a musician, too. Uh, and he uh, was very clever. With, with these, um, the Woolworths records, very often, no, normally, you had on the one record, side of the record, you had a copyright. Uh, 
On the other side, you had one which well, she, he had a team of writers who used to make, make a lot of them out. And he, he was responsible for all that. I don't know whether he was responsible for getting the artist. I think he probably had a hand in it, but I don't think he was the actual artist. He was the manager at West Hampstead. And uh, very often they used to record two or three waxes of a, of a number. And then they, we had to decide which one to use. That was one job I had in, in, in being on the, the committee that decided this. And Jay Wilbur was also on uh, a more important one than I was, I'd say. As well as sitting with Don on the record committee, choosing which version of any recording would be pressed, Wilbur himself cut many discs with his band under various guises. Here he is having a bit of fun, again on Imperial, Today I Feel So Happy. Today I feel so happy, I'm so happy, so very happy. I don't know why I'm happy, I only know I am. I've got no thoughts to spare for, the why or the fair for. When I stroll out folks stare for, I gamble like a lamb. I'm walking on air, never a care, something is making me sing. A la la la, what a da 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 like a little bird in spring. Oh, today I feel so happy, I'm so happy, so happy. I don't know why I'm happy, I only know I am. Wilbur himself was instrumental in recruiting another major figure to Crystallate in 1931. That was the recording engineer Kenneth Wilkinson. Well, before that, I was with two other companies from 1928 to they'd both collapsed you know one was the world echo and the other one was the goodson but they both went broke you know they're unbreakable records <laughs> that's how i knew jay wilbur because we, he used to record with us at the clark and wells sessions house when i was out of work i remembered jay wilbur so i wrote a letter to him and asked him if there's any jobs going you know and he wrote back and said, oh, it was lovely to hear from you and have an appointment with Mr. Haddy. I said, oh, lovely, you know. So I went and saw Mr. Haddy and, and I got the job because he was there on his own, Haddy, on the recording side. So I joined him because I had a past bit of experience, you know. Then we started advancing <laughs> on the technic technical side, you know because in those days we were using a moving iron, what they call a moving iron cutter, which gave iron distortion. So he said, oh, well, we'll try and experiment and make a, a moving coil cutter. And that we did in 1936. And the improvement in quality was absolutely fantastic. There was no distortion. It improved from the bass up to the treble. 1932 saw the Vocalion deal go through 
and production of their broadcast label transferred to the Tunbridge plant. Somebody who was prolific on broadcast was the virtuoso xylophone player Teddy Brown, with records like Happy Days Are Here Again. the most significant artist on the Crystal Lake roster was the band leader Jack Payne, whose signature tune was Say It With Music. He appeared on a tiny three and a half inch promotional 78. Hello everybody, this is Jack Payne speaking. I've signed an exclusive world contract to record my band only on Imperial, and I feel sure that our combined efforts the result in our making some marvellous records, for which, of course, there will be no increase in price. Imperial records are on sale at gramophone record shops everywhere and at all branches of Marks & Spencer. Now, if you turn this record over, you'll hear something else which may interest you. This is Jack Payne speaking. My boys are going to play to you now the tune by which my band is known all over the world. Are you ready, boys? Yes, All right, let's go. He was promising the price would stay down in the face of inflation and competition from other labels. As early as 1931, Imperials had been reduced to one shilling and threepence. This was always much trumpeted in Imperials advertising. Imperial double-sided records are obtainable considerably below the price of competing makes, and the pleasure of owning a gramophone can therefore be doubled without increased expenditure. Meet the Imperial Twins. Tone and price. You'll find Tone a very agreeable fellow. He never grates on your ear and is so strong. Bringing music of the highest class within the reach of all. Just what we wanted, say dealers. First of all, Jack Payne was probably the big... He was near the end of the record period. Um, Jay Wool was a very well-known uh, artist. Montavani... I'm not sure whether Montavani recorded in an orchestra, but on one of these bags it gives a list of artists and gives um, and gives, gives him there. Uh, Sandy Powell was another artist. He was on the Vicarian label, which we, we took over the Vicarian company, by the way. They, they, uh, they were not, in general, the top, the, the top artists. Here's Payne and his band and Love is the Sweetest Thing from 1932, again on Imperial. Love is Thing. What else on earth could ever bring Such happiness to everything It's love's own story Love is the strangest thing No song of birds upon the wing Shall in our hearts more sweetly sing Than love's own story Whatever heart may desire, whatever faith may send, this is the tale that never will tire, this is the song without end. 
love is the greatest thing The oldest, yet the latest thing I only hope that life will bring love story to you The following year, 1933, saw the launch of one of Crystal Lake's most well-known labels along with the Imperial, the Rex label. Advertised as the king of records, hear what you like, when you like. It was a response to fierce competition at the highly attractive price of just one shilling. We heard at the start of the programme from Gracie Fields. Hello everybody, I hope you're going to enjoy my first Rex record. It's alright, it's only a bob. <laughs> Money for jam. But she wasn't the only important female vocalist on Rex. Uncredited on the label of a 1935 Rex of Charlie Coons's Kazani Club Orchestra was an up-and-coming vocalist by the name of Vera Lynn. This was her first commercial recording. I'm in the mood for love. I'm in the mood for love Simply because you're near me Funny but when you're near me is in your eyes Bright as the stars we're under Oh, is it any wonder I'm in the mood for love Why stop to think of weather This little dream might fade We put our hearts together Afraid if there's a cloud above, if it should rain, we'll let it. But for tonight, forget it. Recording engineer Kenneth Wilkinson remembers the event well. Vera Lynn, worked with Vera Lynn, with Charlie Coons and his Casino Club Orchestra. He was the one that discovered Vera, Vera Lynn Ambrose and his orchestra, who then took over Vera Lynn, because she didn't know pro- how to dress properly, you know, in those days. And he took her on and improved her. But she's really got a natural voice, always in tune, amazing. And who was it? Anne Shelton. Oh, yes, we made many recordings with Leslie Serrani and his partner then, it was Leslie Holmes. The two of them you know, did a lot with Sandy Powell. And talking of Charlie Coons, Kenneth remembers his odd little traits. Well, Charlie Coons, for one, he was so nervous, you know, he's, he's a pianist. It's got a different style of piano. He would only let me record him, or or when Arthur Lilly joined us, Arthur Lilly, but he wouldn't let anybody else record him. Nobody could come into the studio because he'd fall off the piano stool <laughs> with nerves. Strange. But he's a lovely man, really. You're listening to The Crystallate Story on BBC Radio Kent. The Kent Company that was responsible for making thousands of much-loved 78 records. A whole host of stars were issued on Rex. And here's another famous group quite early in their career, the Mills Brothers and Sleepyhead. 
Again, another band remembered by Kenneth Wilkinson. They managed to, to get hold of the Mills Brothers. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. But fantastic group four. And they sang harmony. It was absolutely beautiful. Sleeping hair. Good for nothing, sleepy hair. As we've already heard, Crystal Eight had been making records for Woolworths for many years. Since 1931, their label had been the 8-inch Eclipse, but in 1935, the new 9-inch Crown took over. We've already heard from Jay Wilbur. As well as his career in front of the microphone, he'd been musical director for Crystal 8 for some years and was responsible for launching Rex. But he still continued to record for both the main labels and the budget Woolworths labels. Here's yet another of his bands, the Rhythm Rascals and Tiger Rag on the new Crown label. Where's the tiger? Where's the tiger? Hold the tiger! Wilkie remembers that they would knock off recordings for all the labels in the same session, but using different or assumed artist names, just like in earlier years. We used to do the expensive one, that's Imperial and Rex. We did those four, t using four t tunes in a session. And then they used to take the introduction to the music, which they used to play a lot then, and we recorded for the... The Woolworths record, same session, same musicians, different name, of course, when it went out in Woolworths. 1935 and 36 saw Crystal 8 resurrecting a label name they'd acquired back in 32, issuing now highly collectible records on the Vocalion Swing and Celebrity Series. By now, though, competition was even stiffer, bigger world events were looming, and Crystal 8's affairs were reportedly not in good shape. In 1937, the company's record business was acquired by Decca amidst the turmoil of financial difficulties and Woolworths finishing their contract. Decca didn't keep the Kemp factories on and transferred production of the remaining Rex and Vocalion labels elsewhere. For Don Chalklin, it was a tough time. Speaking personally, when, when that, uh, it was a bombshell. I picked up the newspaper one morning and saw that De Decca had taken us over. And I was in my 20s then, and it was a, a real blow because I had, even though I said I was fairly well versed in the record business, but I'd got no other qualifications, and therefore. Uh, uh, I, I didn't know what to do. But in the end, I, I, I went into printing. I, I took, uh, took over the, the printing side there and tried to commercialise that. But for Kenneth Wilkinson in London, there was slightly better news. He was just told that Decker were buying Crystal 8. So we were naturally worried because Decker had got their own recording studio in Thames Street, I think, nasty place. When they decided decided on who they should take on, we won. So it was Addy and I, and they said if there's any of the Decker engineers you'd like to take over as well, you're quite welcome to. So we did. We took on uh, Arthur Lilly. It was one other, that's all. So Arthur was quite a good engineer. He was very good. I've never understood why, <laughs> why they did it. 
Chris Slate were making money, Jekyll's losing. And so in 1937, our Chris Slate story ends. The factories here in Kent continued, though, producing plastics and mouldings. Eventually, the town works in Tunbridge were demolished to make way for a link road, but if you ever drive past Tunbridge home base, then you're as close as you are likely to get to Kent's record-producing past. In Golden Green, meanwhile, the housing estate of Sherandon Park now stands where the factory once stood. The only remaining sign of it is a house called The Pines, once home to Crystalate's managing director. Yes, that, that was where Charles Davis, who, who really was responsible both for Golden Green and Tunbridge, he, he was over... Over, I mean, he was both my father and um, and also ran the Golden Green Factory. Uh, he'd been there virtually from the start, I think, and um, he, he lived in that house, and I'd been there and played tennis there too. As well as all the records it made and sold, Crystallate left a serious legacy in the history of recorded sound. And the two engineers we've heard from today both went on to distinguished and important careers. Arthur Haddy went on to make recording history, developing state-of-the-art recording techniques critical to the war effort and making the technical advances that led to Decca's full-frequency range recording system in the early 1950s. I don't want to stick my neck out, but um, I heard afterwards that Darrell Morford Davis, who was the chairman of Crystal Aid, he told... Uh, he said, well, Ted, you've, uh, you've got a good bargain, you know, in buying the Crystal Lake Company. But he said, the best dip buy that you've made is young Hattie from Hampstead. And that came back to me. The old man told me that himself. But um, we were so enthusiastic in those days. You know, we used to work, work at four o'clock in the morning and just purely for the love of it. Kenneth Wilkinson accompanied him to Decca and recorded artists and bands all over the world, earning about a dozen Grammy nominations and winning three, as well as being described by many as the greatest recording engineer ever. We're indebted to all the people who've contributed to this programme, including the City of London Phonograph and Gramophone Society, and in particular Frank Andrews, whose detailed history of Crystal Aid appeared in the Society's magazine, formerly called Hillandale News, now under its new name of For the Record. We'll leave you with this, another Rhythm Rascals tune on Crown, and I'm tickled to death, I'm me. From Andy Briggs and myself, Andy Garland, goodbye. Well, boys, what are you going to sing? I don't want to be anybody else but me, me, me. Oh, gosh, oh, gee, I'm tickled to death, by me. Hey, play that thing, boy! The Crystallite story was written, produced and presented by Andy Garland and Andy Briggs. Complaining of their luck, sorry they were ever born and all that kind of truck. Now they complain that fate doesn't treat them fair. They even grumble at the faces nature. 96.7 at